So uh, good afternoon. Uh, so we're going to go into a, a deep dive into ventilation and insulation and how they relate to PAS 2035 and domestic retrofit. Um, so my name is Lisa Pasquale. I'm the technical lead at Retrofit Works. Um, a bit about my background. Um, I'm trained as an architect and chartered as a building services engineer. And my specialism is specifically in low energy building physics. Um, so this is very much my wheelhouse. Um, so aims and agendas. So with the domestic retrofits that employ insulation and air tightness measures, um, we do need to make sure that we're upgrading ventilation um, to basically ensure that we don't compromise the air quality of the home. And to be, to be quite honest, not only do we want to not compromise it, we want to improve the air quality of the home because at the moment, even uninsulated homes can have quite poor air quality. Um, ventilation, which previously was provided by advantageous infiltration, so basically just the house not being very airtight, um, needs to be replaced with purpose provided ventilation which, once the home reaches a certain threshold of airtightness. Um, so what we're going to go through is a bit of background on why we need ventilation, what types of ventilation there are, what the PAS 2035 requirements are, what the new Part F 2021 requires, um, and the IAA testing process um, to assess the air tightness in the background ventilation of a home. Um, and then we'll go through a bit of Q&A um, and a close. Worried about damp and mould? First off, we need to understand what the problem is. Damp and mould are caused by an excess of moisture and can create problems for our health and for our buildings. However, just like our bodies, we need some moisture in our houses in order for them to function well. So we need a balanced amount of moisture to keep a healthy home. Moisture can create problems in your home through the many forms water can take. When water freezes, it expands into solid ice, which can burst uninsulated pipework. Liquid water from leaks or flooding can lead to damp in the floors or walls. If your guttering becomes blocked, then rainwater can overflow, saturating your walls in specific areas, sometimes even leaking through to the inside. But the most important form we want to discuss here is water as a gas, water vapour. Whilst we're all used to the sight of steam from a boiling kettle, most water vapour is not so easy to spot. There is always water vapour in the air around us. We produce it when we breathe, along with any animals or plants in our home, and also through daily activities such as cooking and washing. If there was no water vapour in the air, then nothing would be able to live. OK, so here's the technical bit. At different temperatures, air can hold different amounts of water vapour. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold, known as its holding capacity. But when there is more water vapour than can be held by the air, it becomes full up and condenses into liquid water. Outside of your home, this is how rain is formed. This also happens when warm, moisture-rich air meets a cold surface, like a single glazed window in your home during winter. Condensation forms as the air suddenly cools against the surface and the holding capacity of the air is reduced. Because air can hold different amounts of moisture at different temperatures, we measure how full the air is by something called relative humidity. If we have 100% relative humidity, then the air is full up and the vapour becomes liquid water. But even when there is no condensation, high relative humidity can be uncomfortable and lead to mould and other problems. At the other end of the scale, air with 0% relative humidity is excessively, and in fact, impossibly dry and uninhabitable. We need a relative humidity of somewhere between 40% and 65% for most of the time for the building atmosphere to be pleasant and healthy. So we come back to balance. Not too dry, and not too moist. Where does the moisture in your house come from? Outside of the home, the most obvious answer is rain. Good construction is vital to avoid water entering a building from the roof, walls and windows, along with suitable ground drainage in the case of flooding. Inside, we have our direct uses of water in our daily lives, washing and drying clothes, cooking and bathing. All these produce visible liquid water and large amounts of not so visible water vapour. Next, we have the organisms within the home, human, animal and plant. 
All of us produce water vapour as we breathe, or plant breathe. If the number of people, pets or plants changes, the balance of moisture within your home may change dramatically. Remember how hot and humid the air gets at busy parties. But you didn't have a problem before. What's changed? For damp and mould to appear in your home, you need an excess of moisture, visible or not, that leads to an imbalance. What has changed? Has something stopped working? Has the weather changed? Or have you changed the way you live? Or have you made improvements to your home? Home improvements need attention to detail, and sometimes they can put things out of balance. For example, improving windows or insulation is great for heat retention, but if the installation leaves gaps, it can create colder areas, called cold bridges, where the moisture can condense and mould can grow. If you draft-proof your home, but ventilation is not also considered, then moisture levels can rise and push the house out of balance. So a good ventilation strategy is needed. Different types of building in different locations need different approaches in order to maintain balance. Older buildings deal with moisture in a different way to newer ones, so require a different approach when renovations or changes are made. Buildings in windy, wet places often have different kinds of materials and design. If we don't take these into account when we change things, we can end up creating more problems. What to do about it? There's a lot to think about, but the key is to hold on to the idea of balance. The balance between the water, outside and in, your house and your activities. Firstly, understand your building and how it was designed to work and stay healthy. Try to understand the building as a whole, fabric, services, occupants and its context, as all these factors are connected. Try to stop any excess water getting into your home, from the roof, windows, walls or foundations, and also the internal plumbing. Check for leaks, missing tiles on the roof, broken seals around windows and cracks in the render. This is obvious, but not always straightforward. Simple maintenance is always a good starting point. Try to reduce the excess moisture from your activities within the home. For example, by keeping lids on pans or drying clothes outside. This is not always easy in winter or if you have limited space, but do what you can. Finally, make sure the water vapour generated in your home stays at a healthy level through proper heating to increase the holding capacity in the air and good ventilation to get rid of excess vapour. Try to understand your home's ventilation system if it has one. This can mean opening windows when you know an excess of vapour is being created. It's easier to heat your house if it's well insulated, of course, but remember that a consistent approach should be taken so that you don't have an imbalance of warm and cold surfaces. One more thing. Don't worry about little bits of damp or mould, particularly around windows or in showers and bathrooms. It's quite normal, especially in extreme weather conditions. Sometimes there is not much you can do except wipe the water or mould away. Just keep an eye on things and ask an expert if you're not sure. To learn more about the causes of damp and the balance of actions, check out our tool here. Living in a balanced home is good for the health of the building, its occupants and their wallets. Right, so um, that hopefully explains the background of why we need ventilation um, and what its kind of purpose is uh, within, a bit, within a home. Um, but how do we go about designing ventilation? So obviously most British homes, uh, traditional British homes were designed to effectively be ventilated by the fact that they were very leaky. Um, so we need to be taking a, a slightly different approach when we go and retrofit houses. So the ventilation is designed based on a number of attributes in a home. So part L 2021 assumes all bedrooms are double bedrooms for the purposes of sizing ventilation. Um, so this is effectively saying, right, there's X many people that are living in the property. Um, and that gives us a, a sense of how much ventilation we need to remove um, the vapour that's produced by respiration, by just basically breathing and physically being in the property. Um, the number of wet rooms needs to be taken into account, and this includes baths, kitchens, toilets and utility rooms. Um, the ability for air to travel between rooms. So we need to be looking at um, when we're constantly ventilating a home, uh, so when we're using mechanical extract, constant mechanical extract ven ventilation or MBHR, um, we need to be able to make sure that we're moving air between rooms because some rooms are being used as intakes and some rooms are being used as extracts. Um, and so we need undercuts of about 10 mil 
um, in order to allow the the air to move from one room to another to be to, to ventilate the whole house. We need to make sure we have a clean, safe and adequately sized intake. Um, so basically we, we shouldn't be putting intakes next to, for example, boiler flues. Uh, we don't want to be putting um, basically our, our intake air right next to an exhaust of some kind um, that would otherwise pull in unsafe air. Um, we want to make sure that we have adequately sized extract from wet rooms uh, to remove moisture and smells. Um, and we want to minimize any duct runs that are inside the home. So basically, if we've got duct runs that are, um, let's see, yeah, if we have a centralized mechanical system, um, we need to make sure that we're we're making the duct runs as efficiently as, as efficient as possible. And one of the main reasons with that is, especially in retrofit homes, um, one of the biggest complaints we have from residents is that they're they're so unaccustomed to having fans in their house um, that they don't like the noise. And when we have inefficiently designed duct runs, um, that noise actually increases because the fan power has to increase to accommodate uh, or to basically overcome the fact that the ducts aren't very efficiently designed. Um, so basically the fan power increases and then the noise increases um, and also ducts can be quite loud. Um, so they can kind of reverberate sound um, and basically transfer that into the home. So we do want to make sure that we design ducts quite effectively effectively and efficiently um, to make sure that we're not creating excess sound within the home. Um, we want to employ demand control, um, so ideally humidity sensing uh, to extract and improve efficiency. So basically we don't want to be extracting warm air from the house when the relative humidity is already sitting at 40 percent. If it's sitting that low, we don't need to be pulling additional air out of the house. We can let it sit for a while. Um, and reduce how much energy that we lose through ventilation. Um, and we want to recover heat from extracted air wherever it's feasible. So this isn't always practical um, in terms of where we can put, um, where we where we can physically fit uh, mechanical extract ventilation, um, MBHR, because the duct runs get quite complex um, in terms of supplying and extracting air. Um, so where it's feasible, yes, we should be looking to do it. Where it's not, um, then we look at other means as well. Um, so what types of ventilation are there? Um, so intermittent extract ventilation, IEV, um, this is the most common, the one you're probably most familiar with. Um, it's now referred to in part L as natural ventilation. Um, intermittent extract ventilation is a fan, uh, fans in the wet rooms, so bathrooms, kitchens, utility rooms, toilets, um, which switch on when required. Um, so this isn't necessarily the, the old school was when you flip the light switch in the bathroom, the fan kicks on and stays on for an extra few minutes after you turn the light off. Um, the new way is it, it switches on when the relative humidity in that room hits a certain level it switches off once the relative humidity drops below a certain level. Um, so intermittent extract is on only when it's required. Um, it's only feasible in relatively leaky homes um, because it relies on some amount of background ventilation being provided by uncontrolled drafts. Um, it does also require background ventilators um, in a number of the rooms within the house, um, so all the habitable rooms as well as some of the, the wet rooms. Um, so it does require purpose provided intakes in a lot of instances. Um, do, 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 do. The intakes are typically through trickle vents in windows, um, but this could also be through through wall vents. Um, so this is one of the issues that we've, we've got in some cases um, where we're working in conservation areas, we can't necessarily put in trickle vents into windows. Um, it becomes quite tricky to figure out how to bring ventilation discreetly into the home. Um, so it's something to be aware of if you're working in a conservation area. Um, cross ventilation between rooms uh, via door undercuts. Um, I'll explain this in a bit more detail a bit later, but um, effectively, if you do have um, if you do have intakes in other rooms, um, you do need the door undercuts to make sure that air can move from a habitable room into a wet room and then be extracted out of the house. So passive stack ventilation. I'm, I'm not going to go into this partially because it's largely been, um, it's, it's not particularly viable in retrofit. Um, so effectively, it's only 
feasible in relatively leaky homes. It relies on background ventilation being provided by uncontrolled drafts. Um, it extracts from the wet room, usually out through the top of the house, um, through a, a sort of ridge vent um, or potentially through a chimney. Um, it does require a fair amount of ducting, which is why it's not always feasible because running ducts up through a house vertically can be quite problematic. Um, so again, I won't get into this because it doesn't tend to be a retrofit solution very often. Uh, mechanical extract ventilation. So this is probably our next most common retrofit solution, um, and this can be either centralized or decentralized. So mechanical extract ventilation is only feasible where we've got a good level of air tightness. So it's less than um, an air permeability test of five cubic meters per square meter of surface area of the building um, per hour at a pressure of 50 Pascal. Um, so any of you that have done new build housing that do pressure testing to make sure it meets the building regulations, um, you need to be achieving that test of a five or better. Um, the extract fans are again in the wet rooms, but they operate 24 seven at low level. And then they boost to a higher rate of extraction when the humidistat or the occupancy sensor triggers it and says it's required. Um, so basically it will operate a very low level, very low hum, continuously pull air through the, through the house um, and basically continually ventilate the house. And again, this is to compensate for the fact that it is a more airtight building envelope. So you need more purpose provided ventilation than you would get with a naturally ventilated or an IEV system. The intakes are again through trickle vents um, in windows or potentially through wall vents. Um, however, they are only in habitable rooms, so we don't put them in the wet rooms. Um, and that's basically because when you've got this constant draw of air, if you've got a trickle vent in a bathroom, where which also has one of these, these extract, constantly running extract fans, what you'll effectively do is short circuit the ventilation. So all it will do is pull air from the, the trickle vent that's inside the bathroom and pull it straight back out. So it won't ventilate the rest of the house. Um, so effectively, we make sure that there's uh, there are trickle vents only in the habitable rooms. Um, and if there are already trickle vents in the wet rooms, then we try to make sure that they're permanently closed um, so that we don't short circuit the ventilation and it does pull through all the way through the house correctly. Um, the cross ventilation between rooms has to be via door undercuts, which is typically about 10 mil. So again, the system can be centralized. Um, so a single point of extract from the home with ducts connecting the fan box uh, to the various extract points um, or decentralized with individual fans going through each, each wet room. And it depends on the type of house you're dealing with as to which strategy we'd go for. Um, so I happen to be doing a retrofit on my, um, on my tenement in Glasgow. Um, my walls are 800 mil thick of solid stone, um, which if you've ever seen a guy have to core drill, um, the poor guy looks like his arms are gonna fall off within about three hours. Um, and I've got um, three wet rooms that need extracting, a utility room, a bathroom and a kitchen, um, and basically three core drills, you know, the, the poor guy that would have to drill that would have a heart attack. Um, not to mention it would look a bit rubbish to have, you know, three vents going out the back. Um, so effectively I'll have a centralized fan box and one core drill out the back um, to basically exhaust the three rooms because uh, they are quite small rooms. So it depends on the type of home that you're, you're dealing with as to which approach you might take. If you've got a house that has a loft space, by all means, utilize the loft space, go up through the loft um, and, and get the, the air out in a, in a more effective way. Um, so, yeah, different solutions, different ways of going about it. Um, the next most common um, is MVHR. So MVHR can be quite tricky uh, to implement in the retrofit because it requires ducting for both the extract and the intake. Um, so you have to be able to supply the air into the habitable rooms. Um, and also extract it out of the wet rooms using ducting. Um, again, it's a little bit more feasible if you have a loft, um, either preferably an insulated loft, um, but a loft of some description or um, potentially a solemn or crawl space or something that you can run ducts through, insulated ducts through. Um, it's only feasible when you have very good levels of air tightness. So you need to have an air tightness really of about three cubic meters per square meter uh, per hour at 50 Pascal or less. Um, and that's only from the point of view of 
by that point you're recovering enough heat that it's worth the extra kind of cost and faff of putting in a system like that um, it starts paying itself back kind of at, at roughly that point um, the extracts are again still in the wet rooms they still operate 24 7 at low level and they boost to a higher rate of extract when required so it's the same as mechanical extract ventilation in terms of the operation it's all ducted back to a central fan box. However, this fan box will have a heat exchanger and it will have an air intake um, that's that's quite nearby. Um, and effectively what it will do is take all the heat um, that's in the extracted warm, moist air um, and transfer it into the colder intake air that's coming from outside. Um, and it does that indirectly. So effectively, um, if you have a plate heat exchanger, you have kind of a cast iron plate the warm moist air gets pushed up against that plate it warms that cast iron and as the cold air comes in that heat gets transferred so heat always transfers from hot to cold which is why it works as that's just the nature of thermodynamics um so effectively uh and this came up during the the sort of covid debate debate um because it's an indirect heat exchange there's no actual mixing of the air um, MVHR with indirect heat exchange is considered the most hygienic form of ventilation um, because there's no mixing of the extract air with the intake air. You're only transferring the heat from one to the other. Um, and so long as your extract is reasonably far away from your intake, um, there shouldn't be any mixing outside of short circuiting outside with um, the extract air going out and the intake air being kind of sucking that back in. Um, it's always centralized with a single point of extract from the home and a single point of intake. Um, the ducts do require a fair amount of space. Uh, the heat exchanger and the filters require regular maintenance. So you do need to be able to access it. Um, it provides the cleanest and the most energy efficient form of ventilation. Um, it is difficult to achieve in practice, but I would say it also, according to uh, RIVA, which is the, the European Ventilation Organization, uh, R-E-H-V-A, um is according to them it is also the most hygienic form of ventilation um and again it's because the extract and the intake don't in any way mix with one another um so if you're looking at it from a point of view of um you know covid protection going forward if you're looking at sheltered housing um where you need to make sure that you are providing um elderly and vulnerable people with very clean air um this is worthwhile looking at because it, it is the most energy efficient as well as the most hygienic so part f and 20 pas 2035 annex c so effectively at the moment for retrofit we've got kind of two sets of guidance um for how we should be going about ventilating homes um, so part F just recently came out, um, PAS 2035 Annex C has been out for quite a while. Um, and effectively part F was based on what Annex C was attempting to do. So the guy that wrote the new part F, um, he was sitting in quite a few of the committee meetings for PAS 2035. He was aware of what was going into Annex C. He was aware of why it was going into Annex C. Um, and what he tried to do is incorporate as much of it into part F as possible to basically just make that the standard that we deliver um, retrofit to. So um, they are almost identical in most respects with a couple key differences. So the ventilation sizing is identical, except for the fact that this, the way that the calculation is phrased in part F is just simpler. It's just easier to understand. Um, the actual maths are the same. Um, it's just phrased much more clearly in part F. The acoustic standards that the ventilation has to meet are identical. The commissioning standards are identical. The installation standards are identical. Um, the background ventilation um, requirements are better and clearer in 2021 um, part F than they are in Annex C. So they, um, I would say the part F supersedes Annex C in terms of background vent. Door undercuts are identical. Um, all new windows um, at the moment re now require trickle vents, so that should just be part of any window replacement anyway. Um, and extractor fans will always need to be fitted um, as part of part F. So you, there's no kind of two ways around the fact that as soon as we touch a wet room, we need to put extractor fans in. As soon as we upgrade ventilation in any way or insulation in any way, upgrade the building fabric, extractor fans have to go in. 
Um, the key differences are the trigger point for when purpose provided intakes are required in the case of partial or staged retrofit. Um, so basically in Annex C of PAS 2035, we have to provide purpose provided intakes um, the second we touch the building fabric. So as soon as we upgrade any element um, in terms of insulation and airtightness, we need to be providing intakes. Um, that's since been slightly revised. Um, but basically part F um, allows us to do certain minor and major measures um, before we start upgrading um, and providing purpose provided intake. So basically it accounts for the fact that most houses are relatively leaky and you need to do a certain amount of work to the fabric before you start pushing it to the point where you need purpose provided intakes. Um, part F does not account for extreme over occupancy. So where we have more than two people in one bedroom. So if you have say a two bed flat and five people living in it, um, it will, part F will still ask you to size the ventilation as if there are four people living in it, not five. Whereas Annex C will expect you to size it for five people. Um, PIV has been removed from part F. So PIV is positive input ventilation. Um, and this is, always been a slightly controversial method. Um, it has its advantages, which is um, especially actually in high radon areas. With PIV, you put a fan in the loft space that then basically pushes air down into the home. That air goes into the home and should go out through trickle vents. So you effectively reverse the trickle vents. Um, the problem with it is you then have warm, moist air getting pushed into the building fabric which can then get into all sorts of cracks and crevices where it might meet colder structural elements of the building, then condense and then cause mold rot and various other things. So if you've got warm moist air getting forced into the joist ends in a masonry wall, you can end up in accidentally basically rotting out your joist ends and causing structural damage to the floor. Um, that said, in high radon areas, PIV can basically help to suppress radon in the home, push it out of the house. Um, but that said, a, uh, a crawl space sump works just as well for that as well. Um, so PIV has been removed from part F. It is listed as an option in Annex C of PAS 2035. Uh, my personal view is that now that it's not no longer in part F, it's not an option for retrofit. Um, but that's my personal interpretation of the regulations. Um, I believe there are other people that have a different interpretation of that. Um, so it's just something to be aware of um, that PIV is no longer an acknowledged form of ventilation in Part F. Um, Part F also allows enough flexibility for secondary glazing in some instances. So this is one thing that we, we ran into quite early on with applying PAS 2035 is that once you put secondary glazing into um, homes in historic areas, conservation areas and whatnot, um, it then runs into a problem of how we then bring air into the house because obviously we're using secondary glazing so it doesn't impact, permanently impact the visual um, kind of aesthetic of the house from the outside. Um, but we need to provide purpose provided intakes under PAS 2035. So, the only way of doing that with secondary glazing is to then put a wall vent, which then puts an even bigger thing on the facade. Um, so this hasn't entirely kind of panned out, <laughs> um, but basically part F allows us the flexibility um, to put in secondary glazing because it distinguishes between minor and major measures. So, and this is how it does it, um, is it basically goes through the key kind of retrofit measures. Um, and distinguishes the difference between a major measure and a minor measure in terms of its impact on the air tightness of the home. So renewing loft insulation, doing loft conversions, anything really that goes on at the top of the house is gonna have a really minor impact on the air tightness. Um, and one, that's partially because hot air rises. Um, so your drafts predominantly come from down low in a house. Um, and also because, yeah, it's just, it's not uh, an element that's really air sealed in any way. Um, so it was never going to provide a high level of air tightness to begin with. Um, wall insulation, so filling cavity wall um, is gonna be a relatively minor measure in a lot of cases. Um, 
installing EWI or IWI to less than half of the external wall area is a minor measure. So if we're only doing it to the back facade of a building because the rest of it's protected as a conservation area, it's a minor measure. If we're actually applying EWI to three external walls on an end terrace, then it's a major measure because that's most pretty much all of the external wall. Um, so it depends on the extent of the wall insulation as to whether it's a minor or a major measure. Replacement of windows or doors. So replacing less than or equal to 30% of the windows and doors is a minor me measure. More than 30% is a major measure. Um, and again, it's just partially because the way that we replace windows and doors now um, is much more airtight than what we used to do um, back in the day. So, so long as it is a fence installation, um, it should be relatively airtight around the perimeter, the, the window, um, and you should actually have some significant kind of improvements from that. Um, draft proofing measures. Um, replacing a loft hatch with a sealed or insulated unit is minor. Sealing around service penetrations is minor. Sealing or insulating a suspended timber floor is a major one. So this can reduce the infiltration in a house easily by anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. Um, so you get a huge value um, in terms of reducing drafts by dealing with a, a suspended timber floor. Um, that said, once you're you're into that, you're definitely going to be needing to look at providing correct ventilation, correct intakes, uh, purpose provided intakes, removing a chimney or providing another uh, another means of sealing a chimney internally or externally. So sometimes we think of just like popping a, a chimney draft excluder up as a minor measure. And it, it by all means is. But actually, you've just cut off a huge amount of the, the infiltration to a property. Um, and I remember when I was doing the work to my flat, um, I was doing a lot of very dusty work and my chimney was open. You could actually see the dust go up into the chimney, um, which is one very interesting, but two also very cold. Um, so actually, once you cut that off, even though it's a minor measure to go and put a chimney draft excluder in, um, in terms of changing the ventilation dynamics of a house, it's a huge measure. Um, so you need to kind of take that into consideration. So if you follow the elemental kind of process that they've got in part F, um, what it allows you to do is do um, category A, um, category A retrofit is up to two minor measures. Um, and that basically means you don't need to, you only need to put in extract fans, you don't need to provide purpose provided intakes if you're a category A retrofit. If you're a category B, um, you need to do a bit more. You need to provide the extracts, but also you may need to provide intakes as well. And category C, you need to provide a full ventilation system. Um, so this allows some staging for when you have to put in trickle vents um, and door undercuts um, and also allows you some kind of sensible staging as to how you kind of progress through a retrofit. The one thing that's a little bit unclear is when you're dealing with a, a much, much older property, which has already received a certain number of minor or major measures in the past, is do you account for those or not? Um, so this is still a little bit of a, a question for all of us as to how exactly we work our way through this in terms of compliance. Um, so what problematic scenarios have we run into in practice? Um, so the Trigger points for ventilation works in PAS 2035 is any air tightness or insulation measure to a home, even if it's minor. Um, and this is why actually the Part F um, revision is really quite welcome is because it gives us that kind of staging of saying, right, we're only topping off the loft. We really don't need to be putting in um, a ton of trickle vents and door undercuts and all the rest of it because it's just it's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, Retrofitting trickle vents into relatively new window headers um, will void any existing warranty. So basically, if you've got windows that were put in five years ago that don't have trickle vents, those windows would probably still have five years worth of a warranty left. If we then go insulate a suspended timber floor in that house, technically we need to go cut into the window headers and put trickle vents into those windows. And then we've written off the window warranty for the remaining five years. Um, so this is where we've run into some serious problems in practice with people getting quite upset of, you know, a builder going near their window with a drill um, to, to basically retrofit trickle vents. Um, homes in conservation areas need to go through planning to put in either trickle vents 
um, or through wall vents. Um, so we're, we still don't have a very clear path through on that as to how we address air intake in conservation areas um, in a controlled way. Um, homes with no heating systems that want secondary glazing. This was a particular one I worked on. Um, it was in a conservation area. The ladies heating had, had packed in ages ago. Um, she just wanted secondary glazing to be a, be a bit warmer. And basically we couldn't install trickler wall vents um, because we couldn't touch the external walls. Um, and effectively we would have had to make the house worse um, than it would have been in terms of drafts just to get her the secondary glazing. Um, and again, this is where part F brings in a little bit more sensibility about the staging of when we when we upgrade certain things. Um, homes with metal windows where we, we can't retrofit trickle vents, we, we can't drill through a metal window and, and put a trickle vent in. Um, we're still kind of at a loss for how to deal with some of those. Um, we have found that um, the electrical code, uh, so basically the 18th edition of the electrical code will trigger a full rewire of a home in order to install a single spur for fans, um, sometimes off the back of very minor upgrades. So we have hit a number of instances where because PAS 2035 requires us to upgrade the ventilation, we do anything to a home. Uh, we replace a door and suddenly the door is the trigger point. The door replacement is a trigger point for a full rewire of a house, which is a bit is a bit much. Um, that said, that's not changed with part F. Part F would still require that as well. Um, so we were running into, say, some kind of <laughs> almost, I don't know, PR, PR issues of having to rewire people's homes um, off the back of very minor upgrades, which is a, a little bit problematic. Um, da, 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 da. So where we know a house to be extremely leaky, so like multiple open chimneys, um, the a suspended timber floor, all the rest, we know the house is nowhere near the level of air tightness of requiring trickle vents. Um, the standard previously did not give us the option to prove it in order to tailor the NXC requirements to the specifics of the home. Um, and this has now been resolved, um, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, and why is it different? Um, so it's basically to do with the phrasing of Annex C is they use the phrasing correctly sized background ventilators. Um, whereas part F uses the phrasing, the the ventilation provision. Um, and that might seem like really minor differences in language, um, but a ventilator is a purpose provided device. The ventilation provision includes advantageous infiltration through the building fabric. Um, so basically Annex C was asking you to look for purpose provided devices in the house. If those weren't present, you had to install them. Part F says you can basically allows you to account for the fact that the house is already leaky um, and thus doesn't require you to put in ventilators unless the house is below a certain level of leakiness and thus it requires purpose provided devices. Um, so that's the key difference is it might seem really, really minor, but it's basically just a tiny tweak of language where uh, that means part F allows you to account for infiltration allows you to account for infiltration in your design. Annex C does not technically. Um, now, this has gone through uh, a lot of discussion with Bayes, Trustmark, um, BSI, and a number of other kind of organizations. Um, and we basically found a bit of a workaround, which is um, the IAA, the Installation Assurance Authority, I believe. Um, has created a pre pressure testing process to basically verify that the air tightness of a house um, is such that we don't require background ventilators and we don't require door undercuts in certain instances. So it's basically saying, look, we'll just test a given house, see where it is. And if it doesn't require back trickle vents, then we've got the evidence to say it's leaky enough. We don't require trickle vents. Um, so the process is aligned with part F's delineation of major and minor retrofit upgrades. It allows us to estimate the final air tightness based on a baseline measurement. So basically we do a pre-retrofit test to see what the building is to begin with. And then we do a post-retrofit test to basically verify, right, how, how much have we improved it? Um, 
and that enables us to demonstrate this is where we started this is where we ended up the house has adequate ventilation now that we're finished um, and we can basically certify it as a correctly designed ventilation system um, so what it allows us to do is um, in the case of this one so if the air this uses a, a method called pulse which is an instantaneous um, low pressure um, air tightness test. So this pressurizes the house to four Pascal instead of 50 Pascal. Um, if the four Pascal test comes in at below one air change per hour post retrofit, um, we need to provide purpose provided intakes and door undercuts. Um, if the equivalent extrapolated result of um, an air pressure test of at 50 Pascal is below five cubic meters per square meter at 50 Pascal, then we need continuous extract. If it's above five, we can use IEV or natural ventilation. So basically this one test gives us the two numbers that define what the ventilation strategy needs to be. Um, so if this number is above one, we don't need undercuts and trickle vents. If this number is below five, we need continuous vent. Um, and effectively, so this is one where we were a bit borderline. Um, the house was only receiving a top, a loft top up, which should have negligible, negligible impact on the air tightness. So despite being relatively near threshold, so this is 1.6 off from an air change of one, and this was 8.84 um, off from five, um, Basically, we didn't need to provide purpose provided intake, so we didn't need to retrofit any trickle vents um, and we didn't need to upgrade the ventilation from IEV to DMEV. Without using this test under PAS 2035, we would have needed to retrofit trickle vents into the existing windows with loft top up because otherwise we would have failed the ventilation assessment for not having purpose provided trickle ventilators. Um, so basically, this allows us to account for the air permeability of a house and to do without purpose provided ventilators where it's appropriate. Um, so it gives us the evidence that we need to show that the house is adequately ventilated. Um, and this is basically the gist of where ventilation and insulation stand at the moment in the UK. Um, so it is kind of an evolve evolving field, but hopefully that's given you enough of a of an understanding of what's going on.